advisory of the flight control modules, so they're independent and hanging off there. So if we're getting for a backup software, you may hear more about that from my colleague Joey tomorrow. Um, as the flight control modules make that determination and uh, take the, the flight control modules down. System level ball management. The uh, display units themselves, they're smart heads. Uh, we will be GL um, using uh, some high data as a, as a modeling tool working with the astronaut office. So, they can study a ton of functionality on board. And I've uh, just selected the, the vector of that, uh, which is this, and now we're starting to work slightly. And those are all the display formats themselves, as well as the LED on the side, the touch screen.
there's a better version of it that has really cool music things, the whole iTunes. Uh, when we go on sale, this is, uh, of course, our Delta Support Heavy launch that we did on uh, December. Uh, in December, this is a new stack, of course. We're actually a payload to go on sale. We do a little bit of sequencing. Kind of did a hollow, of course. They talked about a quarter inch supply. And then 
you go through the, the sequence of jettisoning and so forth. This is a good example of the sheer amount of, of onboard sequencing uh, that occur in the delicate blend of the actual uh, grounding and onboard with that automation. In the case of onboard, uh, the guys figure they're probably going to be unconscious at this point, so um, there's not a lot of manual intervention required. Um, but you can just, uh, that was the, the, the port of recovery off here, and now we start some parachutes. We have parachutes on the vehicle, and we stacked up all the different things that it has to pull stuff off, and we'll look at that in the ESP one just a few times. The um, watch is the thin end of the parachutes, which uh, isn't terribly exciting, so let's pop back over to the slides. And we'll come uh, from the first of the, of the uh, capsule itself, we'll show you some of the, the seeking of the parachute. So, uh, assuming that that does occur, that's a pretty short mission if that happens, right? So, um, assuming that does occur, now we're up on, on orbit. Um, usual stuff for us observers that is our bread and butter, right? I'm going to pull here. Air tracker, GPS based attitude, and NAV, CF, the RCF, the ox thrusters, which are uh, kind of hidden here, but they're, they're on the back end of that SM. And they uh, hop in the main engine. That's an OME, uh, it's an orbital maneuver right off the shuttle. So we're using those that they actually all flew right on the shuttle. Um, so we pull those off. But you see when we go visit the space center, it gives them off it as we pull the PMC fry. And you're not getting back to those guys if you're just in place. The uh, solar ray pointing, we have both teasers and DSN. I guess there's no D anymore. Um, that's uh, interesting from our perspective. Array management, same old stuff, right? Point to the arrays. Uh, data recording and playback and then call management. What's unique or interesting from my perspective? Um, environmental and life support, don't have to do much of that in most of our uh, spacecraft that we build. Pressurization, humidity control, turns out uh, people put out tons of humidity and we have to flush that. CO2 rejection. Obviously, this way we have to manage the foot of it. Um, we have something that's not in the sequence. The interaction between the vehicle crew and ground. So, everything we just had to meet this morning to talk through again how crew and FCC and the upward automation want to interact. ATPs and pause and resume and um, shipping EPDs and so forth. So, this, this is a significant amount of architectural work that has to go on to define how we want the automated sequence to work. If they want to, Linear, I mean, in terms of the emission sequence. It was so complex, we had um, two dozen different pyro events that had to occur. Um, I think we looked at around 100 different measurement disruptions for that sequencing that occurred. This is sort of on a, a whole other uh, kind of scale there. Um, full mission coming back up like software. So, in addition to having four flight computers so we can handle any upsets that occur, we want to completely be similar. Set of software that would run to, to protect against common mode software faults. And we were talking this morning, I think one of the questions was how do you not pull into the data? We were very paranoid, and again, here's why it's programming. Paranoid is as long as the universe is yet you, which is how we operate. We don't want any interaction between the primary system and the backup. Um, we do, of course, have common, you know, if the I and you all have a design flaw, then we can need you, so we're all in trouble if that were to happen. So we're using you know, some areas that are definitely, um, we're counting them to work. But all of the million lines of flight so there's about 17 trillion ways you can hang yourself with that, right? So you're going to hear more from Joey tomorrow about sort of the, the logic we use and scaling down and having a, a super simple safety net uh, underneath that. But after everything from um, asset sequencing, LAS awards, uh, any ballistic entry, we're going to have a burn that, that, uh, that's occurring and so forth. And then it's video on so we have got 13 cameras on board now. Um, that's for the public affairs, which is actually a, a pretty good but also for uh, 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 the inspected vehicle. Those lessons learned from, you know, from the shuttle is you always want to be able to inspect your vehicle from outside. So we have cameras out there on the ship for the solar arrays that allow us to be selfies, which is going to be pretty cool, uh, but also very effective, right, in, in the sense of the secret special. So uh, now we're in deep space. So the guys gave us a nice boost out to the moon. Um, they triggered it, and now we're on, on our own. Um, usual stuff, ground based math, uh, automated mission sequencing, kind of bread and butter again for this crowd. Um, kind of what I call something more unique function. 
functionality. So we have the requirement to any time we turn um, without COM from the ground, in case our face network and the MCC and everything just goes off for a few days. Um, so we want to go back. So that's where the optical map comes in. Patient monitoring. Uh, again, we hung out. We should have in the sound element. But this will focus, uh, focus more on, on that. So the crew is radiation rather than magic radiation affected the ionics versus more of the biometric. And um, on that, they have a shelter where they have the shelter in place in the event of a, of a large solar event. We talked about it earlier. Any time of early return, that's a pretty big deal. You know, for the spacecraft, we're headed out, we're headed out. And um, probably redundancy is okay. And here, we have a Yeah. 
that allows them to do a lot of thinking with that based on what's going on. So, and again, landing site accuracy, that's a good example of selection. Uh, mission sequencing, being able to stop mission sequences that are not safety critical, but uh, ones that are safety critical, they don't want them to be able to do, unless it's an Apollo 13 kind of situation, we do want them to. So there's a layer of inhibition that enables and so forth, and all really has to be architected up front in the airport The other thing about
see the SARS-CM operating system in the case we go into a stable The military was like totally excited about picking us up out of the water. It was like like a reunion. Um, so let's see. So let's talk about entry. So we we land off the San Clemente instead of the middle of the Pacific. Now what that means is you start to work through and coupled with that anytime return capability, but then we have to be able to handle coming up from the, the south. You work out through you know maximum declination and all that stuff. It says you can do like before you get to your nautical mile. Entry interface to where you can flash down. That's the driver for needing to do a skip. You just can't come in and milk enough energy. And L to D, you know, Pablo is, I think, 0.33, we're about 0.25. So even though you're at about 28, you just can't get that far down there. And you just have to do a skip. Um, they actually did the skip flex software for uh, Craver, who worked with us. Uh, they just couldn't get it to fit on the CPU. It's a careful predictor, predict where you're going to land, and then you do some bank angles. Not a closely closed form analytical solution. So we have it. Um, we've obviously polished it like heck over the years, but now we're finally we're finally playing it. So that was why they landed in the middle of the Pacific because they uh, darker wasn't good enough to support flight bumper. Um, we practice well. We talked about Apollo. There are multi critical event based triggers that occur throughout the entire sequence. Uh, I forget the number, I think it's like two dozen different pyro events that have to occur to get both the other parachutes out. Um, it all automated with crews to provide the economy of it. Uh, the primary and backup, let's like offer download. The two guys are the normal one. If we fail into uh, things like that Lowe's managed that I talked about, where the crew doesn't care so much about landing accuracy, but just wants to keep the loads down. Able cross range control, so maybe they just want to show left for whatever reason. We have to be able to, you know, come back to the moon, you're pretty committed, right? You know, if this big storm off of San Clemente, then you're going to have to do something. So either you want to pull up to a different landing site, or maybe trying to steer north as far as you can to a high speed base. It's, it's always interesting, it's ballistic, which just means you're kind of rotating constantly, you can't on all the lifts. The good that is it doesn't require any action. The um, few loads there really there are uh, that you might expect. But you're going to land wherever you're going to land at that point that you're not doing guided trips. Um, you definitely want some some uh, uh, backup loads to fall down to. You roll left like part I'm in the program office, kind of do a little bit of DD type uh, activity. This is the, the slide that gets me pretty excited. What do we do with that? So uh, we did one. EM1 is coming up. That'll be that lunar system retrograde orbit, uncrewed. That'll allow us to shake out the rest of the, the onboard system, the in-flight system. Entry is, is obviously hottest in ESP-1. Uh, it will be that the first crew flight was in 2020. So we're in the final flight software zone for EM-1. EM-2 is already software development has already started and the play the control through the work through crew belt and so forth. The EM-2 will be a crew flight, and that's what I was showing you that the lunar orbit. Then what comes after that? We're working on design requisitions with uh, ESC, which is the guys that oversee us a lot, plus Orion, plus Orion Alley right now. Um, there's a question you go out and, and look up, you know, uh, improving on it, you'll get to the, the NASA strategy page. There's no question we're going to model this up over. So the first mission is what we call the proofing ground missions, and that's been slipped through in the space. There's really about two more things we have to do for Ryan Flight Software. And, and uh, the updated slide um, for this one, for the record, the part of that I hear what I said that the upgrades were mostly flight software. And it has some sensors and a handhold for the crew, but it's really mostly flight software. But I don't think that was wrong. So we got less than 5% of the additional flight code to go. That would cover rendezvous car stops and docking, which is, uh, you know, incredibly interesting and cool, but it's actually not all that hard anymore. We've all been doing it for a while. Uh, 15, 20,000 lines of code. Um, and EVA, which is mostly, to be honest, is a mechanical thing. Got to put some pressure controls on the hatch and so forth. Those are the updates we have to make to basically allow Ryan to do anything uh, in the cislunar orbit, um, as well as to, to then basically get it out to Mars. So we're working through 
through those and add that right now. Um, the most one, and this is where we're starting to partner with the science community because um, we need to not be competing for the funds, but rather to uh, actually help with our robotics and power side and the observatories and so forth. Um, so we're going to scout for return. Making the basis is obviously very interesting as part of the table uh, survey. We're going to have that data science support. I talked about the Nepar side, uh, radio observatory, nice and quiet back there. Um, so I have a crew that's sitting in a halo orbit at L2, which is very effective for setting that up and getting it going. Um, and then, of course, you know, love it or hate it, the idea of bringing a large rock back towards Earth. Never worked out in the movies because you would have this uh, <laughs> in real life. Uh, went back, and so when we actually bring one back to lunar orbit and, and uh, rendezvous with that, or go out to a, a nearest asteroid, that's very really interesting because as the pilot stress guys are finding out, you don't really plan on an asteroid or Deimos or Phobos, you, you come up and hit it at a thousandth of a G, and you hit it very gently. So there's a lot to be learned, uh, both from the Elon crew guys that are starting to break it down for us and then get the, the actual uh, asteroid. Where are we going to do with that asteroid? <laughs> um, but it's obviously part of our sort of our near term startup activity. All right, so questions. Do we need to know where to begin with questions? Open questions. So, okay. Yeah. We're ready. We're ready. You want to record the question? Thank you. 